<laughs> I'm sure that's more than sufficient. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Um, so then, Anya, I guess you want to start it, and I'll just make a quick introduction. We're off and running. Welcome to the April 2022 Transportation Committee meeting from Community Board 14 Brooklyn. I'm Barden Prezan, one of the co-chairs. Steve Cohen, the other co-chair, is also here, waving happily. Um, briefly, just want to run through the names of the other members of the committee, because I know we're going to have a number of guests this evening, and I just want you to be able to recognize us. Um, Hindi Bendel, are you here yet? Um, Alvin Burke, we hope will show. He's our distinguished chair emeritus. Uh, Naomi Lipnick. You're here. I can see you on the screen. Um, Maria Ravon Hazelwood. Not here yet, possibly. Don Marie Walker. Well, you'll see their names when they pop up. And Glenn Wolin, I think you're here. I'm here. There's Glenn. And we have two incipient public members joining us, John Pulio and Liz Denise. We have two presentations this evening. Uh, the first is a report from the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, and that will be given by Jerry Bogatz, who's the Assistant Director of Planning and Program Management for NYMTC. And the second presentation will be from Transportation Alternatives, uh, the main presenter, I gather, is Kathy Park Price, who is the Brooklyn organizer of TA. And I gather there will also be a supplementary presentation by a number of community members on behalf of Flatbush Streets for People. So I'd like to hand it off to Jerry Bogatz and take it away. Great. Thanks, everyone. Can everyone hear me? I hope. No. No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'll take the yes. <laughs> Um, so, thank you for the invitation. We're, we're always happy to talk about the wonderful world of federal funding. Um, it's a process that we spend a lot of time explaining, particularly to local municipalities, community boards in New York City and so forth, uh, because it is difficult to decipher exactly how this funding happens and gets, uh, gets to transportation projects in our region. So, I'm going to try as quickly as I can to go through some of those details with you and particularly focus on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, at some point and the additional funding that that's bringing into the process. Um, so uh, just to start, you know, what is this thing called the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council? Uh, it's a metropolitan planning organization. Uh, it covers New York City, Long Island, and the Lower Hudson Valley. As an MPO, as, uh, that's the acronym for it, uh, it is a regional council of governments uh, and it, we have nine voting and seven advisory members. I'll go through that in just a second. It's required by federal legislation that authorizes funding for transportation. So there's over 400 of these councils across the country uh, in metropolitan regions uh, because of that requirement. And these organizations are responsible for the mandated uh, planning process that brings federal money into a metropolitan region. So our membership includes five suburban county executives, uh, Nassau and Suffolk on Long Island, Westchester, Rockland and Putnam to the north in the lower Hudson Valley. Uh, we have two New York City uh, members, uh, the director of the Department of City Planning and the commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. Uh, also, we have the state commissioner of transportation and the CEO of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. So those uh, those nine members signed the MOU, which created MTEC back in 1982. Uh, they are the voting members of the council. They make the decisions on uh, adopting the planning products and making the decisions on how the federal dollars are going to be used. We have a number of advisory members, including the Port Authority, uh, as well as our sister MPO to, in northern New Jersey and New Jersey Transit. And you might wonder why the Port Authority is, in fact, an advisory member. They're obviously a very important uh, party to transportation in our region, uh, but they make very little use of federal funding. They are considered to be a, a, a self-financed public authority. Uh, so although they need to be at the table in any kind of planning process that's, that's meaningful in this region, uh, they don't vote on the use of federal funding. Uh, we also have the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and three uh, federal agencies, Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit, and US EPA. 
this is NIMTIC. I am I am staff to this uh, council. So uh, if you're thinking of NIMTIC, you're thinking of this particular council of governments right here. And we as the staff work with our members to fulfill the transportation planning process that is required for federal funding. Um, so here are the major elements. I mean, this this can get incredibly confusing because of the different levels of funding that are involved in transportation. Uh, but basically, you have you have the federal line, which uh, starts with Congress first authorizing and then appropriating funding for transportation, and then um, apportioning that funding in most cases to the states, and then New York State, which is the second box here, uh, then suballocates that within New York State to uh, metropolitan regions here which are represented by uh, metropolitan planning organizations. And of course, the funding ultimately gets to a project sponsor to actually produce a, a transportation improvement. Uh, the state also has its own line of funding. If the New York State Legislature appropriates funding for transportation, and that gets to a project sponsor at some point. And then, of course, there's the local, uh, local counties, municipalities, not, not the least of which is New York City, and public authority budgets do affect this process also. And uh, some of that goes to project sponsors for to fund transportation improvements. Uh, sponsors tend to be the owners or the operators of the transportation facilities or services. Services. So whoever owns the road, whoever owns the bridge, whoever owns the rail line, whoever operates the buses, those are the sponsors that have to actually use the funding and, and make the improvement happen. Uh, NIMTIC is here in the process. We are the regional council for this region uh, that is supposed to uh, basically come to consensus on how the money is supposed to be used and, and do the planning for it. Uh, and some of the funding that comes from the state and local line actually move through the federal process also largely as local match. There are local match requirements to most of the federal programs uh, and sometimes overmatch. So it's not strictly within these, these funding silos. And there is this discretionary line which we'll hear about more because there's a lot of money involved in this in this line under the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, these are nationally competitive projects that uh, are selected at the discretion of the U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Um, so although they have to come through the planning process, in a sense, the decision on which is to be funded is made uh, at the at the federal level uh, for discretionary programs. So th this is the basic setup of how funding happens, federal, state, and local, for transportation improvements in our region. And we have to follow a process. There's a specified process to bring federal money into our region, starting you know, up here with the orange circle with a long-range regional transportation plan, ultimately getting around the corner here to a transportation improvement program, which identifies the actual projects. We have to analyze those programs and plans for congestion and for regional emissions. Ultimately, the money gets up here to project planning and implementation. That could be, you know, rebuilding a roadway. It could be buying a set of buses or rail cars. It could be uh, improving the signal system in the New York City subways, whatever, whatever the individual projects are. That's the ultimate goal here is to get the funding to projects and our um, as you'll see our transportation improvement program is is voluminous uh, we we have usually between a thousand and fifteen hundred projects in our region uh, we're the second largest mpo in the country by population so um, moving forward is our current regional transportation plan i just want to go into that really quickly because that's really the foundation piece of the planning process um, it is developed over a number of years. We just adopted this uh, this particular plan last year. Uh, it's federally required, and it basically serves as an enabler and a guideline for federal funding. And um, it recommends a number of things, including in this particular plan, uh, 17 major and various minor system enhancements, uh, totaling roughly $50 billion. Uh, you can see some of the statistics here, 125 transportation projects uh, that are in years six through the end of the plan, basically. Uh, nearly 400 vision projects, which are aspirational and uh, hopefully will get turned from concepts into actual projects at some point. Uh, investment recommendations for human services, transportation and specialized services, and then strategies and actions for short term planning activities guided by member shared vision. Um, so we have to show how we pay for the plan. I mean, that's 
really one of the, the primary requirements of the federal process is not only planning for the money and coming to consensus on how it's to be spent, but also showing that we can uh, fit the projects that we want to pursue into the likely uh, money available. So the plan does forecast uh, resources, it forecasts costs in the long term, and it establishes uh, what what improvements in the long term and um, issues of system preservation uh, need to need to be within the funding envelope that we think we're going to receive. And we're talking about some big bucks here. As you can see here, this this plan covers fiscal years 22 through 2050, so it's a 29 year plan. Um, and you're talking about almost a trillion dollars for operating and maintaining the system on a on a regular basis. We have to show not only that that's what the cost was, but also that there was sufficient funding in the long term, uh, reasonably expected to be available for that. And then, of course, on the improvement side, you have uh, system preservation which uh, really eats up most of the f funding we will we'll have coming in, $750 billion, because our system is so large uh, and because it tends to be old. There's a lot of system preservation need out there. System enhancements totaling $50 billion, uh, the estimated funding envelope is about $805 billion in the long term. So these numbers are huge. Um, you know, it, it's a test we have to we have to pass in terms of our planning. Uh, but the more uh, the more real numbers are the ones I'm going to cover uh, next, which is in our transportation improvement program. Uh, by the way, we we also look at additional financing strategies in the plan. Many of these have been used or are about to be used in our region, and they they recognize the fact that there's so much of the regular funding, quote unquote has to go for uh, system preservation. So that if we're looking for system enhancements, uh, we often have to look at, at the project level at innovative ways to finance at least part of the package. And all of these uh, financing strategies, like I said, have either been used or are about to be used in our region. So here's the other part, which is the transportation improvement program. This is the program of projects that have been identified to receive the federal funding. So if the plan is, is long range and conceptual, the tip is where it crystallizes into actual projects. And usually that's between 1,000 and 1,500 projects in each five-year transportation improvement program. Um, it's a multi-year program. It, it's multimodal. And it's drawn from and has to be consistent with the regional transportation plan. And it includes really all modes of, of surface transportation, um, everything except aviation, essentially. Transit, roadways and bridges, bicycle pedestrian projects, system demand, and demand management projects and programs. Our current program is about $32.3 billion. Uh, our current tip is fiscals 20 through 24. As you can see here, the majority is actually state and local. Uh, federal makes up about 46%, about uh, $15 billion. But obviously it's not the majority, but it's a very important part of the funding that we need. Uh, we're not going to, you know, somehow turn our backs on the federal funding. It's very important that we receive that funding uh, to try to uh, leverage it and, and make real improvements and real enhancements to our system. Now, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, otherwise known as the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which is what the administration calls it, uh, is in fact um, the new Federal Authorization Act, which was passed and signed into law in November of 2021. It authorizes uh, funding through fiscal 26, and it's a very important part of the picture going forward because of the increases in funding it, it makes possible. Um, these are the formula funding programs uh, that are administered by Federal Highway. Uh, just know that the formula programs are the ones that are apportioned to the states and then suballocated within the states, as opposed to the competitive or discretionary programs, which are, you know, uh, the, the selections are made by the Secretary of Transportation. You can see here some of the percentage increases are significant. There are actually two new programs here, Carbon Reduction and Protect. If more time were available, we could go through all these, but um, just know that all these programs are bringing significant dollars into our region and they have different uh, uh, eligibility requirements and so forth that have to be met to, to use this funding. On the transit side, uh, these are formula funding programs that are administered by the Federal Transit Administration. Overall, transit authorizations, although less than highway, are 44% higher under the IIJA. And you can see the different sections of uh, Title 49 that make funding available for different types of transit needs. 
And then very uniquely in the IIJA are about a dozen or more uh, competitive and pilot programs. These are discretionary. We call them discretionary. The federal government calls them competitive, and some of them are pilot. These are again uh, over a hundred billion dollars worth of funding are in these programs that are nationally competitive, and that are um, the selections are made by the Secretary of Transportation. And you know there are a number of we've grouped them by their their functional areas here, so you can get a sense of them. We don't have time to go through all these, but um, clearly there's a lot of money in the IIJ, unprecedented amount of funding that is in these discretionary and pilot programs and uh, very competitive and um, right now basically the administration is scrambling to get um, uh, various guidance documents out about these new programs many of them these are new um, and so guidance documents rules if necessary and notices of funding opportunity and they'll be coming out um, pretty regularly over the next several months as they move these programs out and get funding out to people. And of course, their focus is on the midterm elections. So um, they're gonna move out a lot before that happens. Uh, in terms of where we go from here, um, there are a number of unknowns, obviously, that affect transportation, um, including the duration of the pan pandemic impacts, which we really don't know, you know, the. Uh, what's going to happen in terms of whether we're slowly moving away from the pandemic, whether there'll be future surges and so forth. Uh, the pace of the recovery, uh, we have a better sense probably of of the pace of the recovery from the pandemic, but that could change. And uh, it is somewhat unpredictable in terms of uh, uh, how certain aspects like transit ridership are in fact going to continue to recover uh, even in the, in the short term. Uh, there are public perceptions that are at work here uh, in terms of the safety of of, of public transit, both in terms of the pandemic and increasingly the public perceptions of, of crime and, 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 and as it affects mass transit and so forth, they play into this. Um, there are changes in business and employment practices, which we really uh, can't predict in terms of uh, how quickly employers are going to really bring people back into offices on a regular basis. Um, and uh, because of the pandemic, there have been some population and employment shifts and uh, the nature of post-pandemic mobility really is, is, is hard to define at this point. But on the transportation side, uh, we know we're looking at increased federal funding and also that federal funding impacts state and local finances or has impacted state and local finances and kept them afloat. Uh, we're seeing more service innovations, particularly on the transit side as transit operators are looking to bring people back into their systems. Uh, and we've seen modal shifts big time in terms of people who might have been transit uh, users prior to the pandemic who are now not transit users and are using other modes. And of course, uh, automobile use is pretty much up to pre-pandemic levels, but mass transit is not. So um, that's, that's a trend that's going to be very difficult if it continues. Um, we've seen an evolution in both shared mobility and micro mobility. These are bike sharing, uh, car sharing, ride hailing services, uh, non-motorized modes. Uh, there is an evolution, but it's over a small base relatively. So that's a good, that's a good uh, sign and where that's going to go and how much further it's going to evolve. The pandemic has certainly accelerated those areas. And uh, we, you can anticipate that there'll be a continuing reliance on telework, and we really don't know how that ultimately is going to evolve and how business models are going to change, how employment models are going to change. And that obviously affects travel and it affects transit ridership. So, um, you know, the, the future is muddy at best, and uh, there's no there's very little precedent on which to, to predict uh, what might happen going forward. So uh, we have various scenarios that are in mind, but... Uh, you know, what, what's actually going to transpire is, is pretty difficult to know at this point. So um, in a nutshell, that's my story in terms of how the funding comes to us and how the decisions get made on how it's used. Happy to answer any questions. Um, and, and clearly this is a difficult process for most people to really get their arms around. And certainly people at a local level, like a community board, uh, to really appreciate how this is all playing out. Um, and so be happy to answer anybody's questions on that front. Thank you so much, Mr. Bogatz. Greatly sure. appreciated. Um, and as you say, uh, it sort of leaves us a little starry eyed. It's not often we see the number a trillion dollars flash across our screens at the community board level. So are there any committee members to start who have any questions for him? 
Steve, is that you? Fire away. Um, thanks, Jerry. That was that was a great presentation. Those were very informative. Um, I guess one one of my questions uh, regarding the your I guess your second to last slide that had you know unknowns and things in the future, which was um, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering if also on there is um, the transition to electric vehicles and whether because I, I know in the um, in the infrastructure law, you know, one of the things that was advertised was, you know, that the Biden administration was seeking to put, you know, a lot more electric car charging stations out there. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, the extent that that um, that that's that that's a factor as well, uh, weighing in, in terms of uh, unknowns in the future. I think that's a great point, and and I think it's a huge factor because there is more impetus for that in this particular authorization act than ever before, um, and you're going to see a lot of deployments because of it. And you know um, that slide is really looking at what's coming out of the pandemic, and of course electrification is not necessarily pandemic related; it's more climate change related. But it it's an important part. Um, notice also there was nothing in there about autonomous vehicles and so forth; uh, those are unknowns too. Although that technology seems to not be developing as quickly as it might have uh, initially been expected to. Um, so I think you're raising a really good point, and I think electrification is going to be a huge issue going forward. It's a chicken and egg also in terms of, uh, yeah, more people are buying electric vehicles, but until you can, uh, you know, easily charge them, <laughs> then that's going to be limited, and then you got to get the charging stations out, but how far do you go with that before more people buy them and blah, blah, blah. And so, it, you know, it's we're, we're chasing our tails in some ways. Uh, but you'll definitely see more deployment of of charging infrastructure and that does raise issues of also of electric supply you know if you snap your finger tomorrow and every car became an electric vehicle we don't have the electrical capacity to charge all those vehicles on a regular basis so that's the other side of the equation um, how does that happen and how green is that as we go forward um, but that's certainly part of the transition we're in right now thank you for bringing that up actually I'll have to remember to Thanks, switch, switch that slide around. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Nina, I think you were next with a question. Okay, am I on? Hi, good evening. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, so my question is, does any of this funding go toward um, Let's say uh, the development of uh, bicycle super highways, like if they wanted to make a um, passage that went, you know, kind of directly, like say a separate bridge for bicycles only, mm -hmm. other kinds of infrastructure of, along those lines that would be safe for bicycles, micro mobility. I'm using bicycles almost almost generically, but. Um, mm -hmm. Well, the answer is yes. I mean, all those different funding programs have different requirements and some of the most flexible funding sources like the congestion mitigation air quality, the surface transportation block uh, grant program and the transportation alternatives program all all have been used extensively for what we call non motorized transportation. So that would be both pedestrian and bicycle uh, and now increasingly. Um, semi motorized, like electric scooters and so forth. Um, so, yeah, you could through this funding do that. Uh, again, uh, you'd, you'd have to bring everyone to consensus uh, around doing, I know that something like that was actually proposed earlier in the pandemic. There was a proposal for a bicycle bridge from Queens to Manhattan, um, which uh, you know was an interesting concept at the time. And at that time, uh, most of the travel was happening either by car or by, by, by bicycle. There was very little transit ridership at that time, um, even compared to now. So uh, the, the the short answer is, yeah, there's definitely resources that could be used for non-motorized. It would, and, and in fact, we have an element in our plan that's a pedestrian bicycle element. That's that's a requirement, or it was a requirement, but it it shows um, how different parts of the bicycle network in the region and and different pedestrian um, projects will be will be played out over a number of years. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Glenn Wallen, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, I, as a Tesla owner for three and a half years, have a somewhat different question about this uh, future infrastructure, and that is um, <clears throat> the rate of charging. Um, <clears throat> right now, there's something called plug share all over the country, and that tends to charge at a very sl or relatively slow rate as opposed to the Tesla superchargers. 
So I'm wondering uh, if you have any idea what this new infrastructure might look like. Thank I you. think that sure uh, that again, a great point. Um, it's got to be convenient. You know, you can't sit there for 3 hours while your car charges. Um, I think the direction is towards the superchargers as much as possible. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the barriers have to do with, uh, with again, the utility hookups and the, the availability of the utility, uh, the utilities themselves at different locations to be able to support those types of chargers. That's going to be a huge part of the of the mix of, of how this infrastructure is going to be deployed. And um, it's a little bit different than what most transportation agencies have dealt with in the past, because it's not solely a, a, a a road or transit issue. It, it's got a lot. It, it, it's a local land use issue. It's it's a utilities issue. Um, this is this is infrastructure that that we're not necessarily used to dealing with. Uh, so, I can't give you an answer in terms of how it's uh, going to uh, evolve completely. But I, I can tell you that everyone is looking towards the superchargers and towards the most convenient charging that we can produce. Um, but how that's going to play out is a, is a great question. Thank you. Sure. I think that's the last of the board member questions before I go to the public's questions. I just want to throw one in myself, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you have the formula funding programs, the competitive programs. Um, they must be quite numerous and detailed. Are there any that off the top of your head you would think might particularly pertain either to Brooklyn or ideally are part of Brooklyn? And otherwise, are there uh, sources that we can consult where we can sort of get a sense of which of the federal funds might have the greatest pertinence to us? Mm -hmm. I, well, first of all, I think all the programs apply to Brooklyn. Brooklyn has a multifaceted transportation system, touches on everything. You have highways, major highways, the whole nine yards, you know. So certainly the ones I mentioned, the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, the CMAC Program, Transportation Alternatives, these are the types of things where you have a very diverse transportation system, or at least it's evolving in that direction in Brooklyn. So uh, non-motorized, uh, complete streets in, in some cases, um, and, and looking at a full range of, of potential mobility conveyances and, and issues. Um, so in, in many ways, uh, all those programs are relevant to Brooklyn. And it's a question of um, how they get deployed. You know how they're best used. What role the community boards have in that? Um, again, you're represented in the pro in the process through the Department of City Planning and the, and the Department of Transportation in New York City, um, and uh, they do a lot of work to try to represent your needs, not only for federal funding but for funding in general. Um, but it's you know it's it, that that's a lot of different community interests out there in New York City um, that need to sort of be rolled up in some meaningful way into a, a coherent set of transportation improvements. I'm not really answering your question. Uh, no, no, anyway. I, I understand. <laughs> basically, the way that we could have input that eventually would sort of float up to your level is to go through DCP and DOT and yes. lobby them yes. for, and they will then lobby on our behalf to NYMTC. And you also have, um, well, again, they're part of NYMTC, so they don't lobby, right. you know, um, but you also have the 197A plans for your right but those are still existing so uh those plans that's a lot it. of work <laughs> no i know i know no no i know but they exist and and they may have various transportation um needs in them they probably do and so that's part of the process too and that's something that the department of city planning takes into account as they're developing um programs or projects along with city dot so city dot tends to be the more operational agency city planning is obviously the more planning agency but the work you do at the community board level does get looked at, uh, and, and as a, as a whole, as as, a, as the whole city. So, um, it, it it's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of people in New York City, and there's a lot of interests. So, um, making making that um, optimizing that is always a challenge, I'm sure, for the city agencies. Understood. So let me go to the public questions now. Uh, someone identified as Eric J S. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, one thing I was wondering kind of in a very big picture kind of way is uh, to what extent, um, I mean, you're talking about how much funding is available from federal sources. Um, is there a way to track like where that funding comes from originally? Like to what extent it comes from New York City or New York State um, and kind of travels back oh, around? Oh, right. 
you're talking about the donor 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 state issue uh which and yeah yes or, there is a way know, to... to what extent is it like just national debt that's ballooning funding this essentially i think it's a combination on that front in terms of the national debt increasing uh, but if there have been analyses done of uh, New York is a donor state, so we, we send more in tax dollars to the federal government than we receive in in total aid back, uh, not just transportation, but everything. Um, there are donee states that the opposite is true. That's been a consistent debating point for every uh, transportation authorization law that's been passed over the last 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are issues of fairness there that are never fully resolved because obviously Congress has to be able to pass the legislation. Um, I think what you're seeing here with this particular increase coming on the heels of all the relief, um, the relief funding that for COVID uh, is, is an expansion of the debt. Um, but it depends on whether Congress will ever consider to actually increase the a level of resources coming into the federal government and of course there's an economic imp impetus to that too but uh, things like the gasoline tax and uh, or some type of a, a you know um, vehicle miles traveled charge um, because gasoline taxes are getting less effective um, and just general taxation levels how that's going to change over time is ex extremely unpredictable now we have a minimum a proposed minimum billionaires tax which is a derivation of you know things that have been discussed for a long time. Um, that could, in fact, you know, differences in the in the rate of resources could affect the debt, obviously, and and this might not just completely balloon the debt, but um, I think that you know the, the funding you're seeing from the pandemic and onward is is certainly funding that's coming coming out of and increasing the debt. Um, that, that's pretty clear, but New York state is a donor state, um, relatively. And there are not, you could actually uh, Google a number of, there are studies that have been done of, of each of the states and, and, um, what they contribute in terms of taxes and what they receive back in terms of federal aid. Okay. I've got 2 more members of the public and I think after that, we'll tie it up so we can move on to our 2nd presentation. Liz Denise, go ahead. You had mentioned the concern about the trend of additional cars on the road after the pandemic and kind of alluded to the issue of space with additional cars. Um, and, you know, you'd also talked a little bit about electric vehicles, but I'm kind of curious how this agency is looking at electric bikes, which is an increasingly popular option already, um, have a smaller carbon and charging impact. And you can even do awesome things like having charging stations for electric bikes, which would take up a lot less space or have char uh, battery swap stations like they do in other countries. Um, but, you know, especially for since a lot of car trips are very short there, uh, especially with car e cargo bikes that can hold both, you know, cargo, but also can help transport children around places. Um, you know, they're, they're really an, a great option, except that a lot of the infrastructure isn't there yet. So I'm curious how the regional um, agency is like looking at how to make that a better option um, to help us have a greener future. Well, I think I think that varies. Um, I, I don't think our members have one coherent position on that yet. Uh, for example, the suburban counties are not um, uh, are not as as uh, far advanced in 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 pursuing those things. It's not that they're not, but they're not making the commitments that the city of New York is at this point. Uh, so th there's an issue of of policy at that level, you know, at the level of the jurisdiction, um, and uh, there are also safety issues, obviously, that transcend that, but they can be addressed. So there's not one coherent picture in terms of yeah, we're going to do that, we're going to do it to the same level. Um, but the city of New York is particularly far ahead in that. Um, and there are, um, in terms of the electric bikes, um, that's an interesting part of the discussion of charging infrastructure and how that's going to be deployed, uh, particularly in New York city. Um, so I think the answer is, and of course there's more, the, the other thing is, um, uh, there's more local travel in New York city than there are in the less dense suburban areas. Um, so that also plays into it and the travel patterns are different. Um, so I can't tell you that there's one position, but I can tell you that there's a great deal of attention. Um, it, although the, the policies vary across the region. Thanks. And the last question is from Samantha. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just have a couple of questions. Um, one, I, I, if you can give us a little more clarity in reference to the climate change of innovation 
uh, for your plan if I was watch um, looking at the slide correctly, as well as the healthy streets. And I, especially for the healthy streets, um, a couple of concerns that I have is the fact that Brooklyn streets, if anyone drives on it, knows that it, there's so many potholes and just the, without thinking of the innovation part of electrical cars and so forth, just the current structure is just falling apart. And um, another part to that is with what is the plan in reference to if the city continues with the restaurant extensions on the streets, how does that play with the plan? Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I can't speak to the future. Please, briefly. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, the, the restaurants issue is just exclusively us in the city. So I'm afraid he doesn't have to worry about that, but go ahead with the other question. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Um, yes, that's exactly what I was going to say, but uh, that's not to say that it's not a big issue. And, and also curb space management is an enormous issue in the city that does affect. Uh, it actually has regional effects uh, in terms of the healthy streets. I think you're seeing you're seeing two two parts of the puzzle that are kind of counter to each other. Uh, if you remember back to my presentation, um, you know, something like 90, 95% of the resources we expect to get in the long term uh, into our region are going to go right out for system preservation. Uh, that's the level of need. And even with the additional funding that's available through the IIJA, we're not looking at being able to address all our system preservation needs um, without a lot more funding. Um, so what you have is a situation where, you know, city streets that are, are, are well used are worn down and you want to make them healthy. So that's one policy perspective. Yeah. But then there's the other policy perspective of how do you maintain the infrastructure that you have, given the fact that it's so extensive and so old. Um, and I'm not sure I have an answer for that trade off, but um, but it, it, it's a great point that you raised that sometimes you're trying to do one thing and say complete streets or healthy streets, but at the same time, you don't have enough funding to maintain the streets. Um, in terms of climate change, uh, if you look at the shared vision that's in our plan, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on innovation at this point. Uh, to to deal with climate change and get you know reduce the amount of vehicle miles of travel or the growth in vehicle miles of travel and and the innovations have to do with uh, i think uh, uh, shared mobility uh, as it fits into the whole um you know transit system we have an extensive transit system throughout our region obviously most extensive in new york city but also extensive in the suburban areas and so how do you it, how do you uh, supplement that with these new emerging uh, uh, shared mobility modes micro mobility modes and so forth so putting that together i think is a big part of what our members are looking to do at this point in some kind of coherent way that also meets uh, individual local policy uh, needs and and and, and debates um, Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Samantha, for the question. Um, and thank you again, Jerry, for the presentation. We probably should sure. tie it up right now because I know we have a, a presentation of interest coming up as well. Sure. And so thanks again. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. Um, to Just want to say thank you and appreciate the invitation. Oh. Thanks very much. Thanks again for coming. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Steve, Jerry. back to you. Thanks, Barton. Uh, much appreciated. All right, so uh, that was great. So next we have uh, transportation alternatives. Uh, I think uh, Kathy Park Price, is, the Brooklyn organizer, is going to start us off, and then some community members are going to present uh, as well. So uh, looking forward to that. And Kathy, if you want to get started, feel free. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes. Um, good evening. My name is Kathy Park Price and I am the Brooklyn organizer for transportation alternatives. Thank you so much to CB14 for inviting us to speak, especially Steve Cohen, um, who has joined some of our meetings and um, thank you Barden as well. Um, thank you to the transportation committee co-chairs. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with transportation alternatives, we are the advocacy organization that has led the movement for safer, more equitable streets in New York City for almost 50 years. Um, the driving force of our advocacy are the local grassroots campaigns um, 
that are led by neighbors and TA supports those campaigns through providing a platform and amplifying the, the concerns of the neighbors and helping organize the efforts. Um, tonight, you'll hear from four neighbors of CB residents of CB 14 who are leading our Flatbush Streets for People campaign. Um, the again, it's it's a neighbor led campaign and you'll hear all about it, but I just want to welcome um, the the four neighbors, but also welcome anyone to reach out to us to TA um, at Brooklyn at transalt.org if anyone has any questions about TA specifically. But with that, I would like to turn over the presentation to our volunteer campaign lead Liz Denny's to kick us off. Thank you. Hello, um, let me get my slides up here. Um, can you all see my screen right now? There's a present button, but it's currently hidden. All right. Perfect. Um, I'm Liz Dennis. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you again to CB14 for having us here today. Um, I'm a CD14 resident and Flatbush Streets for People is a neighbor led grassroots campaign for safer streets and better buses in Flatbush, East Flatbush, Midwood and Kensington. We're an all volunteer group concerned about rising traffic violence and public transportation issues in our neighborhoods. Um, that's actually the four of us who are presenting on the left of this slide. Um, we mostly walk around to get with to get around inside our neighborhoods and we depend on buses to get around the rest of the city. Um, some of us have been hit by cars, some of us bike and some of us drive. Um, we currently meet every other Tuesday on Zoom and we've been engaging at these meetings with staff from CM Joseph and CM Lewis's office. And as Kathy has mentioned, Steve has come to our meetings as well. Um, so, our campaign is pretty new, um, even though the concerns about traffic violence and slow buses are long running. Um, we've been out and about and growing our campaign and asking people we speak to what they'd like to see for improving all modes of transportation in our neighborhoods. And people speak about all sorts of difficulties, slow buses, no direct routes to where they want to go, close calls they've been in when they've been walking and biking. And despite these difficulties, residents and visitors to our district rely on our streets every day for all sorts of needs. Um, like getting to work or school, going to medical appointments, getting deliveries. But unfortunately, our streets aren't currently working for everyone, which is why part of our campaign name is Streets for People. We think it should be a lot easier for people pushing strollers to not have to zigzag through crosswalks. Sidewalks should be wide enough that it's easy to get around. Bus riders shouldn't be blocked from getting off at the curb. And people biking shouldn't have to weave in and out of busy traffic lanes. So how do people get around in CD14? According to NYC Department of Planning data, the majority of residents don't drive to commute, even though most of our streets prioritize moving personal cars. Residents above 150% of the poverty level are more than 12 times as likely to drive alone to work than those below the poverty level. In fact, the majority of CB14 households don't even own a car, but even of those who do, most people don't actually use them to get around CB14 or visit our local businesses According to a 2019 DOT survey, 93% of visitors of stores at Church Avenue didn't drive to get there. Our streets are also a lot more dangerous for people walking and biking. This is DOT's Vision Zero view for community districts, and you can see that DOT considers CD14 to have a high injury rate, more than most surrounding districts. Sorry, I meant to go back. Oh. This is also data from the first two months of this year, which is taken from that same website. Already three pedestrians have died and many more people walking, biking and driving have been injured. 46 people walking, six people biking and 86 people driving. And by the way, these are the injury numbers for serious injuries that are reported to the NYPD and the actual injury numbers are expected to be higher. We believe that by ensuring our streets are safe and effective for all modes, people walking, biking, taking the bus or driving, they'll be easier for everyone to navigate. Now I'll hand it off to Jeffrey to talk more about pedestrian safety. Hi, uh, I'm Jeffrey Thomas. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I live in CB14, and uh, as Liz was saying, our goal is safe and effective streets, and uh, we're going to talk about making them effective for people walking, people using mobility devices like wheelchairs, and so, forth. so sidewalks and crosswalks. And of course, this is just about everyone. Like even if you've street parked or you took a bus somewhere, uh, you're walking a bit to get around, even if you're just going to cross the street. And unfortunately, crossing the street uh, is not safe. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, again, looking at the data just this year, uh, people killed in crashes, that number has been up this year, 
we are on track to have the deadliest year since the Vision Zero initiative started in 2014. Uh, in our district alone, uh, three pedestrians have already been killed just trying to get where they're trying to go in the first two months of this year, which is a really short period of time uh, compared to the injury statistics over the past couple of years. Uh, and so on the next slide, uh, we, we're just saying we believe people shouldn't have to risk their lives to walk around our neighborhoods. No more pedestrians should be killed crossing our streets. It's a pretty simple thing. Uh, and also on the next slide, we want our streets to be safe uh, and we want them to be enjoyable. Uh, for people walking or your sidewalks are too narrow for people pushing grocery carts or strollers uh, or using wheelchairs or other mobility air aids. Uh, we've got issues on the. Uh, we've got issues on the top right uh, uh, when uh, ramps are flooded whenever there's a storm uh, and it's hard to uh, use many of our streets and crosswalks effectively. Um, but also um, our district lacks uh, public spaces. 70% of CD14 residents live more than a quarter mile from a park. Uh, there aren't many other public gathering spaces and especially in the pandemic, outdoor spaces, uh, enjoyable outdoor spaces have proved to be invaluable for safety. Uh, sidewalks get people to the parks. Sidewalks are also outdoor, can be outdoor gathering spaces on their own. Uh, so on the next slide, what sort of improvements are we uh, asking for? What are we talking about? Uh, obviously, we're uh, on board with improving all of these streets, uh, but I want to call out uh, these three, uh, Coney Island Avenue, uh, Flatbush, and then uh, just a little bit in CB14, Linden Boulevard. Uh, all three of these streets are very wide and busy truck routes uh, with few measures for pedestrian safety. Uh, we understand, of course, trucks and cars need to get where they're going, but in other places around the city, truck routes don't look like you know, these streets because DOT has made real changes to protect people walking. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, on the next slide, uh, some possible ways to improve safety are reducing crossing distances with curb extensions uh, and pedestrian safety islands. Uh, adding raised crosswalks or raised intersections, which uh, slow down traffic a little bit, uh, make people walking uh, more visible, make it easier to cross with a wheelchair or a stroller uh, or with your pet, especially on rainy days, uh, and widening extremely narrow sidewalks. And I should say all of these pictures we're taking from the DOT design toolkit. Uh, these are photos from elsewhere you know, in the city. The photo at the bottom left is from uh, Upper West Side. So it shows these are standard things DOT does in other districts. We're not asking for anything new. We're asking for some equity for this district. Uh, and so that's uh, wraps it up for what we're asking for in terms of pedestrian infrastructure. And I'll pass it to Musa to talk about uh, bike -like infrastructure. Um, so part of our campaign also focuses on building bike routes that help keep our neighborhoods safe. Next slide. The, the, this is the focus of our campaign in addition to the other areas we're discussing because currently our streets are not safe for bike riders. Typically about one in seven people in and around our neighborhoods use bikes to get around over any given 30 day period. Also keep in mind that the number of riders over the past 10 years has increased um, pretty significantly. Now these riders include kids getting around the neighborhood or going to school, your coworkers, and your neighbors, family members and friends. And people use these bikes to get to work, to go to school, meet up with family and friends and get deliveries. But because our streets are so dangerous, their, uh, their lives are threatened and their livelihoods. Next slide. Um, over the last five years, we've seen some pretty uh, devastating stats um, around bicycle safety. For example, we've had a one bicycle rider that was killed. Um, that person obviously represents a loss of a friend or a family and one of our neighbors. And over that same period of time, we've seen 560 people riding bikes getting injured. And as Liz mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, these are just injuries that were serious enough to report to police. Um, we believe that the actual number of injuries are much higher. Next slide. And we fundamentally believe that people should be able to commute, stay active and go to work uh, and excuse me, get around in a green way. Um, that's also safe. Next slide. So what are we advocating for? We're asking for the city to build a connected and protected bike lane network. On the right, there's a map of the district and you can see from the map that the district has almost no protected bike lanes. I think the most prominent one is the one that um, was recently added underneath um, the prospect. Park. Um, this means that uh, very few of our like most of our bike lanes basically get blocked, forcing bikes onto sidewalks or into car traffic, making it more dangerous for car drivers, the cyclists, and for pedestrians. Um, 
Also, the district lacks um, any serious uh, east-west connections between our existing bike lanes, which make the roads unpredictable. And in many parts of the, the district, as you can see towards the, the bottom of the district, there are no bike lanes at all. So what we want is to add protected bike lanes throughout the district, uh, including some on some of our most dangerous roads, such as Coney Island Avenue. We also want to upgrade uh, paint-only lanes to um, protect bike riders um, from obstacles such as double parked cars um, and obviously um, moving cars. And also we want to build out, we're hoping the city will build out an integrated network of bike lanes to make traveling safer for bike riders. This means that building out the east-west connections become crucial, creating a more predictable and safer riding environment. Next slide. So we're, gonna make you and so we're advocating for all of this to make sure that we have safe bike routes in order to lead to safer communities. By separating bikes from cars and pedestrians, we can make sidewalks safer, for example, for people who are elderly, people who have mobility challenges and our neighbors in general. We can also make it safer for people who rely on bikes um, to get to work and go to school by avoiding situations where they veer onto the main road and we make the road more predictable for car drivers themselves. This will help, for example, kids go to school or for more uh, parents to drop their kids off to school. For example, just in my building alone, I have a few parents who drop their kids off by bike. Um, and also help uh, people like me commute to work via bike in a safe way. Uh, so that's what we're asking for, that's what we're hoping for. Um, next, I'm gonna hand it off to John to discuss uh, buses and loading zones. Hey everybody, um, so the next part of our presentation is buses that we can rely on. Um, next slide, so CD14 residents are, and if Naomi you could mute if you can this, but if not, no big deal. Um, CD14 residents are more likely to rely on transit than the city average, so more people here on average are using transit every day, a higher percentage than elsewhere in the city. And next slide. That means that there's over 240,000 people who are coming through our district every single workday um, on the bus. And if we can go to the next slide, that's a problem because in our district, bus service is rated worse than four to five uh, community districts citywide. So we are at the bottom 20% of bus service overall in the entire city, not just Brooklyn, um, and that includes Manhattan, Staten Island, the entire city. One of the reasons for that is on the next slide that 30 to 48% of our buses are arriving late. So it might not seem like a huge deal because everybody's a little bit late, but when you're counting on a doctor's appointment or a connection to the subway or a first day at work or a job interview, that can be a pretty significant issue. And on the next slide, one of the biggest problems is that it's an equity issue, especially in our district. We can go one back. Um, Non-white residents in our district are more than twice as likely to rely on transit in this way. So when we make transit slower and we make transit harder to use, we're affecting non-white residents in our district more than white residents, and that should set off red flags for all of us. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so we have an interesting stat here, four to six miles an hour, which is the speed of an average jogger in Prospect Park on Sunday. I am not that fast but cd14 buses are only averaging 6.3 miles per hour so a kind of slow to medium jogger is gonna out jog um, the average bus speed everywhere in our district which seems crazy that is a huge problem if you go to the next slide for this reason only one subway stop in our district is fully ada accessible and that means that people who are disabled, people who use mobility aids, people who just have a hard time getting around for a variety of reasons, young, old, are using the bus because all the MPA buses in our district are accessible. So it's an equity issue on a lot of fronts. Let's go to the next slide. I think people will recognize the buses in these pictures and the streets in these pictures. Buses are just a daily lifeline for so many people in our district. It means the difference between being able to get home and see your kids at the end of the day. It means the difference between keeping a job. It means the difference between um, just having more time and less frustration, which is something we all want. And it's, a, it's truly a lifeline for 240,000 people who depend on them every single day in our district. And if you go to the next slide, 
What we are asking for then is a bus lane that looks maybe a little different than this, um, a well-enforced bus lane to ensure people can get to their destinations. We can put in all the bus lanes and paint we want, and I know it's been contentious, but we have to figure out a way to actually keep the bus lanes clear. So the 240,000 people who are using them every single day, and hopefully more, um, will be able to get around on the bus quickly and efficiently. So that is part one of my part. Let's move to the next part, which is loading zones that actually work for our community um, in a way that they don't right now. So the first fact that might be counterintuitive is that when you ask merchants in our district, which people have, we're not just making this up, this is all studied um, with real numbers. They say they want more dedicated loading space in our district. You can see these guys are going out into the street to try to unload multiple trucks. I live on Church Avenue and you can see every single day between deliveristas, people walking in the street trying to pick things up and people trying to unload the trucks um, it is a disaster. And I think we all can uh, have seen scenes like this on our local streets, especially the commercial ones. Let's go to the next one. Um, double parking, which is what merchants and delivery personnel of um, any size company have to do, makes our streets incredibly dangerous, both for motorists and drivers, um, bicyclists, and walkers, anybody who's using the road, it's hard to see around these cars, as you've known, it's hard for the buses to get around. Um, and in this, you can actually see a personal car, which are often used for Amazon deliveries and used for all sorts of other, th other things, Grubhub, anything to get around. It's hard to park because of the way our streets are designed. And so we are trying to figure that out together. So let's go to the next slide. Um, what we want to do is make sure that CD14 has 24-7 loading zone space for safer, easier deliveries. We want to avoid the picture we just saw. We want to avoid people, delivery personnel, having to get out of those cars and get sideswiped by another car. We want to avoid having to run around a car in the bike lane and get hit by somebody else. We want to avoid having to peer around a big truck so you and your grandma can cross the street. We've all been there, and it's a preventable problem. So that is something that our campaign is advocating for in addition to pedestrian safety, bicycling safety, the bus, buses we can rely on, and the uh, more 24-7 loading space. So if we go to the last big slide here, what we, if you don't get anything else from our presentation, what we want to say is that we are neighbors, we live here. And when we go out and ask people, hey, like, is this something you want? People stop, they're enthusiastic, they want to take pictures with our signs. We, we get all sorts of reactions and we want to just emphasize that this is a volunteer grassroots effort. This is what the people in our district are really, really, really yearning to see. Um, and it spans all across all income levels, all ethnicities in our district. We have such a diverse district. And one thing that we can all agree on is that everybody in this picture deserves to be safe. And I think everybody in the board can agree with that too. So um, I want to thank Steve and Barton, especially, and all of the board for letting us present tonight. That was, it was fun. Um, and we really look forward to working with you guys in a constructive way moving forward. I know um, we will all be showing up, especially the transportation committee meetings, but we also want to welcome anybody on the call and anybody on the board to our biweekly Zoom meetings. You can see the information right here, shoot us a chat or uh, sign up for the email list. We don't send out too many emails. We're not gonna spam anybody. But um, if this is something you're interested in, we wanna engage with you because we are the community too. And um, thank you so much for letting us present today. And I'll throw it back to, to Steve uh, for questions, comments, and anything else. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. That was, that was great. Uh, thanks, uh, Musa, Jeffrey, Liz, Kathy. Uh, uh, really appreciate all the information you provided. Um, so, uh, similar to what we did before, uh, I guess we can, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions, you can do the use the raise hand feature. Um, if uh, any board members have any questions, we can start there and then move to uh, move to the public. Um, I see some folks are posting in the chat. So, if, if there's any, if there's anything that you actually want to um, answered by any of the uh, presenters, uh, you know, feel free to raise. Uh, use the raise hand function. Uh, it looks like uh, Dwayne, you have your hand up. 
Yes, thank you, Steve. Um, thank you all from uh, Transportation, Transportation Alternatives for, for presenting tonight. Um, I am curious, and it, it's been a, uh, actually a concern of mine for, for a bit, so I'm curious. I wonder, you, you say that you survey the community, um, but I noticed in a lot of those pictures you have as far as surveying, they're, just, they're literally around the corner from where I live. And I'm wondering, have you surveyed all like the quadrants of the community all the way down to Avenue to P, Avenue P? Um, because I've noticed that you know a lot of the feedback from a lot of the articles that have been posted about some of the things you guys have been uh, proposing, and also the, the petition that you guys have been circulating. Um, there's been a lot of pushback from the community for the way it's being presented and incorporated. So I'm wondering, have you guys done like a district wide um, survey of the community outside of your membership? Thanks, Dwayne. Um, this is Kathy from TA. Thank you for that question. I'll just remind you that this is a neighbor led campaign. We're not the DOT. We have been surveying, but it's literally neighbors talking to neighbors. We welcome you to join the effort too. Um, if you want to help get the word out and petition with us on weekends, we're out there on the street. So um, we, as the la last slide showed, um, you know, we welcome neighbors to participate in the process and be a part of the dialogue. It's difficult, you know, it's challenging um, to touch everyone. Um, there's no kind of budget here. So we are, we're doing as much as we can in person online. If you live in a building with the, and that you can share with your neighbors, please uh, let us know because um, we definitely want to do the outreach. And I will um, just invite anyone else from the CB14 neighbors to chime in if they'd like to. Um, I was just gonna say that our campaign is also pretty new and um, we have, you know, we've had some weather issues for like getting out to some of the locations we want to, but we have continued plans to continue to, you know, survey and talk to people um, and get our word, our, get, you know, get information out there um, because we really do want to make a, you know, CB14 that has transportation options that work for everyone so that no one is, you know, cut off from getting where they need to go no matter what mode they take. So more in the coming weeks as well and, you know, months. So um, if I may push back a little bit on that, um, because the way you guys are presenting this is, is that this has been um, you know, a community, this is what the community wants, the people in the district want. Um, and so right now you're, you're, you're pushing it, presenting it as something that is, would be perceived as you've surveyed or you attempted to communicate with the majority of CB14 in some way, shape or form. But it sounds to me like right now that that isn't the case. It's just kind of, um, the feeling of the, 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 preference of the individuals that are part of your your group and organization and and don't get me wrong like i i want to see improvements uh in our streetscapes and i want to see improvements in the way we move about the district as a pedestrian um and and the person that lives in a very congested part of the district uh, i would love to see improvements i would love to see improvements with cyclists i'd love to see improve, improvements with motorists at all times um and pedestrians have a role to play in this too we're not the best we cross all over the place we stand out in the middle of the street, things like that. So we need to improve on things. But I'm curious as to why or when there'll be efforts or why you're presenting this as something that comes across based on your presentation tonight as the community has had an opportunity to weigh in rather than just a small segment of the population of the district. I, 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 can, I can address that a little bit. Um, I don't think we're trying to present ourselves as saying, and I, I want to be very clear, we're, you know, individuals or people who have shown up to transport to transport committee meetings and so forth in the past. Uh, we are not, you know, an agency or anyone who's sort of saying we've done a survey. We've gone door to door. We've knocked on everyone's doors and said this. This is this is what we want. We've been, you know, you know, out there saying we've got this petition. We're interested in this. Uh, and people say, yes, people tell us, you know, I want this. I agree with this. I really think we should be improving in these ways. Uh, I really want, uh, you know, all sorts of things, you know, better, better, more effective buses. I want, you know, space for bikes so that uh, they can, uh, you know, 
I am less afraid to bike so that they are off the sidewalks when I'm walking, et cetera. Uh, I don't think we are meaning to say we've done a rigorous study of the community. This is what we're advocating, uh, you know, I, we're, we're not trying to say, so I'm, I, I don't think we're trying to get the impression of we have surveyed the whole community and this is what we believe. That's, that's not what we are, I guess. So. I guess just going back to the presentation, you know, we're a volunteer group and we're trying to reach out to more people. It's like an evolving process to do this. Um, we're really grateful that the board gave us the opportunity to connect here because it also helps us connect to more people in the neighborhood. And we're looking forward to like deepening these efforts as you know, we already mentioned. Um, and, you know, it, it is a reflection of our group um, that, you know, of, of volunteer neighbors. Um, we're not trying to speak for the board or, you know, any specific agency. Um, it's just a group of volunteers. Yeah, I know you're not speaking for the board, that's for sure, because only one person can speak on behalf of the board, um, and that's our chair. But I, I, I'm just, I would just say, to, say this, you be mindful of the language you're using when you're communicating this out, because even in your presentation tonight, you, it, it presented as if you had somehow surveyed the community at large, and the community wanted this. Like, even your, your, your slide about the sidewalks in the district, that they're too small and that sort of thing, you said the residents of this community district wanted larger sidewalks is that even possible we're an older neighborhood in new york city and they may or may, be, may or may not be opportunity to expand sidewalk spaces um but when you're presenting and you're saying that the residents of cb uh cd14 are the ones that want this and you haven't actually surveyed the community at large because again i'm going based on what i've seen you guys put out publicly and the feedback from residents of the community, the bulk of it has been like what you're presenting is not actually what folks are looking for. So I'm just curious, like we need to make improvements in this district for sure. Parking, um, timing of lights, that sort of stuff is definitely a thing. We've all experienced like what DOT has done to CB14 in the past where they just kind of roll in, do what they want. And then we are left to deal with it as a board and the feedback coming from the community. So. It's very important, at least to me, that the voice of the community gets heard. One thing I, I just to add on top of that, I, 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 when we're thinking about um, the, you know the campaign and how we got going, we we're kind of as like we mentioned, we're all a bunch of residents who've lived here. I was born in Brooklyn, um, and we kind of just by chance kind of came together. And I think the bulk of our campaign is actually just based on raw data, right? I mean, people are just getting hit, people are dying on the street there because our streets aren't designed well. So we kind of came together and noted about the way maybe we present it, but we are residents who just by chance come and um, join together for this campaign. And we're trying to make sure that our buses run faster. I don't think that's a controversial statement, for example, right? That, uh, and when we talked to people, I was talking to a resident just the other day when we were petitioning on the streets, uh, telling her about the campaign and she was pissed because she was 30 minutes late to work uh, because the bus wasn't running on time. And so I think the, a lot of the things that we're pushing for and advocating for in this campaign speak to a lot of people and they're meant to alleviate the deadliness in our streets. And I'm hoping, and we're all hoping that by redesigning the streets, we would actually be able to make it safer for people who drive cars, make it, make it safer and faster for people who ride buses and for people who walk and take uh, bicycles around. All right, thank you. Um, it looks like uh, Nina has a hand up. Hi, good evening. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just reading some of the comments in the chat. And first of all, I'd like to say there actually have been more people. Um, there was a child that was hit and killed. I believe that was in CV 14, as well as um, a young man who was killed by a driver who ran a light, hit another car that then hit him and smashed him against a building that was right on Coney Island. And that was within the time frame that was dated. Our, our streets are are really, really scary and deadly. And all of us here use the streets, whether you're in the north end of the district, the south end, the the east part, the west part. I, I guess I just personally just have to say I'm a little saddened by some of the remarks that I'm seeing um, in the um, comments that it's almost as though people would like to see the status quo rather than something that makes things better for all of us. I don't think anybody here wants to get the news that there, um, you know, that that a family member or a close friend was hit by a car or or hit by a bicycle. Somebody commented on that. And 
Um, I just want to say that in looking at studies in other places where they have made um, done all of these kinds of improvements, what they actually found was that bicycle riders were more, I guess, orderly in the way that they rode their bicycles because they had the infrastructure to support them and because it encouraged when the majority of people on bicycles knew that they could travel in a safe and orderly and organized way, it kind of uh, brought other bicycle riders into the fold because it became unacceptable to do otherwise. So, um, you know, I think I think when there, there are more orderly streets in general, we not only see that drivers calm down, we see that bicycle riders calm down, we see that pedestrians do less of what Dwayne pointed out of just kind of staggering out of the street at all points. Um, so that's all I wanna say about that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nina. Um, the, um, the, there has been an active uh, chat. I noticed um, earlier there were uh, some folks who um, brought up the, the, the proposed uh, or the idea for or a bus lane on Flatbush and some people um, expressing concern about, um, you know, uh, it causing, it wind up causing more traffic or being a nightmare and other, someone asked if a traffic study had been done for it. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I know the, a lot of the presentation was in, um, you know, big, big picture ideas, not, and, the, you know, obviously there was some discussion of um, certain uh, uh, stretches where uh, things could be improved and including Flatbush Avenue. So I'm just wondering if any of the presenters have any um, thoughts on uh, uh, Flatbush bus lane, a potential Flatbush bus lane to address some of the concerns that were raised. I mean, I do think that, you know, we're, we don't purport to be um, DOT or street design experts, and we would expect that there would be studies done to make sure that bus lanes or bike lanes or any infrastructure changes, sidewalks, you know, whatever it is, um, would be handled by experts. Um, we just want to bring attention to it in our neighborhood because, as you know, I showed in the slides, like, we have a more dangerous neighborhood for people for people. Um, on our streets than many other neighborhoods that have gotten a lot more attention to getting safer street infrastructure put in. Um, and so we just want to make sure that that conversation kind of funnels down to our neighborhood because, you know, we value the safety and lives of everyone here. Just to emphasize the point that we're really pushing for the city um, to do that study. Um, when rolling them out to, to hear back from the community, design a safe street, one that moves buses efficiently and moves the most amount of people um, based on their transportation needs. Thank you. And I, um, I don't want to interrupt okay. you, Steve, but I wanted to chime in real quick. I'm, yeah, go ahead, John. Thanks so much. Um, so two quick things. One, specifically for the bite, bus land on Flatbush, we'll echo what everybody else said. We're not DOT. But that said, one of the... Um, one of the things that we can see when bus lanes around the world and in New York City are implemented well is that they encourage people to make fewer trips, to transfer trips from car, private cars alone to public transportation. And so as somebody, I've had to drive in New York a lot. I have elderly friends who have to drive um, and what they want is fewer cars on the road so there's less traffic. And the only way in New York City right now we're going to get less traffic is by having fewer people in their own cars. And so people who don't have to take a car, if we can get, give them an opportunity to take public transportation and get out of your way on the road, that is a net win for everybody. The other thing that I would also say um, in response to Dwayne's super valid concerns about the wording and about the, the outreach we've done is we are here because we want to hear from the board. Like we want to hear from the transportation committee. We want to hear from the full board. We are volunteers who have come together to do outreach and our outreach has said one thing and we are more than receptive to outreach that other people are getting and other organizations are getting that's saying something else. We wanna engage with the community. We're not here to stuff anything down anybody's throat. We're not here to tell anybody what to do. But what we recognize is that the numbers say that our streets are not safe. And a lot of people who aren't showing up to community boards are telling us that they feel the same way. 
So, and a lot of people who are not showing up to community boards are telling you different things. We want to engage. We want to hear that. That's the entire purpose of this. And I really, really want to go back to the slides and take the parts that were not working out. Um, but I so appreciate those concerns and we are here to work together with this board and any other organizations. So that is the, that is the point of tonight. So thank you guys for raising those concerns and thanks so much for, for hearing us out. Thank you for that, John. Um, Sean Campbell, you have your hand up. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm going to I'll springboard off of your wording, Steve, that this was a, a big picture presentation um, and just reach out to the group and, and all members of the public that are on tonight um, um, to ask you to reach out to us for specific locations and specific requests at those locations. The bigger picture stuff, you know, that the community can work on together uh, with all points of view being taken into consideration, but specific, you know, from Additional stop signs on Albemarle to a traffic light that finally went on today on Avenue K and East 27th Street to knockdowns on Church and Cortell U. Um, we we have made requests that DOT has implemented pedestrian islands. Although um, I wish this group would join with me in asking DOT to not landscape them if they can't maintain the landscaping because we've got weeds higher in cars, which sort of undermines the safety. Um, um, goal of, of some of our pedestrian islands, but um, on specific locations, let us let us be of assistance in making um, those requests and letting DOT vet the request through their um, their experts. Thanks. John, I would just I'm just curious if, if you know if DOT would like let community groups or community members help out with doing some of that landscaping. I'm not a landscaping professional, but I do know how to trim back weeds and I would you know be happy to help out with those sorts of things as well. <laughs> I will ask. Sean. Uh, Glenn, you're up next. Thank you. And I have a, I have a couple of com uh, comments. Uh, one is that uh, I think you're very good advocates for pedestrians and cyclists. And for much of my life, I was an avid cyclist. Now I'm a little older, don't bike quite so much. But there are also cars on the road. I'm also a driver. And your possible solutions generally don't seem to take into consideration um, the cars and the traffic and the car owners. So as an example, uh, making the um, loading zones 24 seven uh, is a huge mistake because at night there's nobody coming and the people who live around there can't park there. So uh, my suggestion to you is in your consideration, you have to consider the drivers as well. Uh, another thing to consider is that we are never going to get perfect safety. Uh, I am absolutely for some of the changes uh, that make things safer. Uh, Mayor de Blasio came in with this idea that he was going to knock the 250 deaths a year down, and he implemented lots of changes, uh, slowing traffic down, all sorts of things. And in the end, we had roughly 250 deaths a year. There is a, a floor to this that we're not going to go below. Uh, I do advocate for moving towards it, but you have to take into consideration all constituents in a neighborhood, not just those who agree with you. I'm done. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, uh, I'll, I can answer this take. That's a really, it's a good point about cars. And I wanted to just sort of reemphasize about driving and about this neighborhood. We understand this is not, this is not the same as other neighborhoods that, you know, different people have been advocating for different things. And we, we, are saying we would like our streets to be more effective for everyone, whatever means of transportation they're using. And yes, that includes, and we know uh, people would like to bike, people would like to take the buses, people would like to walk if it were safer and more effective. But of course, that includes, and people said there are many legitimate reasons to use cars uh, in, especially in this in this neighborhood, in this in these district in this district. Uh, and we, uh, at least we we think some of the points we're saying. Uh, loading zones where we can say a car can be you know a delivery truck is parked at a loading zone out of the way you know by the sidewalk where it can unload seem it seems to me at least that that's preferable to a delivery truck is double parked and the street is clogged which i've seen many times you know the street is clogged for you know blocks behind because there's double parking and then there's just gridlock immediately uh and so we yeah we know that there are people who drive and we would like the streets to be more effective and safer for people who drive we uh i, I it's a hard question i think uh, you have a point there about you know are we going to get to the goal of vision zero i don't know i think it's a good goal but i don't know 
when or whether we will get to exactly zero. Uh, but I do think that there are improvements to be made for both effectiveness and safety for drivers. Uh, and I think that a lot of the things we're talking about uh, here, you know, and, and, you know, honestly, getting people into other modes of transportation that they would like to use, getting, we know there's a, a fraction of folks who say, I would love to bike if I could. If they're off the roads, you know, the roads, like Don was saying, the roads are clearer for the people who do drive. I just want to I... add that there are neighborhood loading zones, which is a thing that DOT hasn't piloted yet in our area, which allows for when you go, if you do have to drive and take a trip to pick something up from a store or, you know, to drop someone off, that allows you as a personal vehicle to also use that instead of having to search and circle for parking, which is really hard. Um, so I think that that's part of the goal is to make it easier explicitly for the people who do take those trips by car by giving them spaces that allow them to do those trips by car. If I might add one last point, um, a lot of the problem that exists is lack of enforcement. There are a lot of laws and rules out there uh, about one of the slides you showed a, a truck, a, a rental truck blocking a bus lane. Uh, that's a problem. And you see this all over the place. No standing anytime, and there are people standing there. Um, so I would say that the most important advocation that you could do would be towards enforcement of the current rules, which would make a huge difference because the loading zones, if they were available for loading during the hours that are designated, trucks would try to get there during those hours because it'd be much easier for them. Right? But they can't because people park there. So I think the single biggest thing that you folks can be advocating for is enforcement. And that would make a big difference uh, without all these other kind of changes you're looking for, some of which might work and some might not. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I want to move on to the next question because we've got a few people just put up their hands. So uh, Dwayne, you're, you're up next. Um, just quickly, I, I wanted to um, thank Sean for pointing out, you know, how many requests the board actually received um, related to, to transportation um, ch challenges around the district, and and that we the, the board does try its best to to um, get some of those um, requests resolved through DOT. It does take a while, um, and and for those of us that have been on the board for a while, we we've learned that you know a lot of effort goes into getting some of those things uh, resolved. Um, but I do also want to, as she was speaking, I was thinking about, and Sean, you can tell me whether or not this is still on the website, but we did have a graduate fellow at one point do a survey of our district and some of the safety issues that we had in the district. Um, it was actually very interesting and eye-opening to those of us that heard it at the time. It's a few years old, so you know, be mindful of that. Uh, but you might find some of the safety metrics uh, quite useful to look at. So if it's still available on the board website, I would encourage you all to, to, to check it out. And then secondly, I just want to point out to uh, Liz, um, DOT and the, uh, the um, medians with um, any kind of foliage in them, um, they usually will maintain them, but I think there is, and Sean, you correct me if I'm wrong, there may be an opportunity for folks if it's marked as a park for them to put together a community group to maintain them. Uh, but you have to have one, I think, permission to do it. And two, you have to be apt, you know, very, very mindful of safety. Um, so that's my two cents and I'm done for the night. Thanks, Dwayne. Well, always good to hear from you. <laughs> um, uh, all right, next, uh, Eli, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, hey, how's everyone doing? Um, uh, yeah, my name is Eli. I'm not affiliated with like any group. Um, this is my first meeting uh, that I've attended, but I just wanted to respond to the other gentleman who said that cars weren't being like considered enough because like a, one of the big reasons we have such transportation problems is because like our built environment is like already made for cars. Like cars have a priority pretty much everywhere. And like, that's why it's so dangerous for pedestrians and why buses are so slow. So really, it's 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 quite the opposite. Like I don't think cars haven't been considered. They certainly have. Uh, anyway, yeah. So totally support. You know, more bus lanes for sure. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you for that, uh, Jordan. You have your hand up. 
Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry in advance if you hear my dog barking. She's kind of loud. Um, um, yeah, I um, forget who said it earlier that that um, or who implied that they were speaking on behalf of car owners. And I don't love that implication because I actually am a car owner in this neighborhood and I support this plan. Um, and part of the reason I feel that way is because, you know, I have lived in different cities all over the world, including some with really awful traffic situations. And Flatbush is one of the most dangerous streets I've ever seen anywhere I've lived. And one reason is like, I don't feel safe on it no matter what I'm doing, right? I have ridden the bus there, I've walked there, and I've driven there. And in pretty much every scenario you can imagine, it doesn't feel safe, right? And so I think by trying to serve everybody at once and be everything to everybody, it's not really serving anybody well at all. Um, I think that, you know, it's very easy to like do culture war stuff around bike issues. I think bus lanes are a very different issue because what we've seen is that this neighborhood depends on transit more than the average neighborhood in the city as a whole. Flatbush is one of the two or three most heavily traveled bus lines in the entire city of New York. I think it's like 30 or 40,000 daily riders. It's a clear majority of the people who use the street. Um, so it seems logical to me that we would give precedence and priority to such an efficient mode of transportation when they are just a clear majority of the people using the street. And like, as for me personally, when I'm driving, um, you know, I will deal with it by, you know, going a little bit slower on Flatbush or taking Ocean Avenue or Nostrand or one of the other you know, North South avenues in the, in the area. And like, the truth is that I'll live. Um, but the 30 or 40,000 daily bus riders on Flatbush who are dependent on the bus, I think deserve the highest quality service we can give them. So that's all I'll say. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if any of the presenters want to weigh in. I did see uh, Barton, you had put, in your, put up your hand briefly. I don't know if you had anything to chime in on. No, actually, um... I was just going to sort of reinforce Glenn's point on the matter of enforcement that if, as I put into the chat, if there were one day a year in which absolutely every transportation law was observed by everybody in New York City, it would be just such an astoundingly different environment. And so enforcement really is a part of this puzzle that it's beyond our purview, of course, but you can make the laws, but if not everybody, you know, is going to comply then it becomes chaotic. So basically it's just reinforcing what Glenn had said. Thanks. Speaking of, I see Glenn put his hand back up. So uh, have anything else to add, Glenn? Yeah, just one last thought. Uh, one of the problems with enforcement is that the store owners are against enforcement because as soon as you start enforcing all of those um, spaces and the cars double park their tickets, et cetera, et cetera, they start losing business. It's a really intractable type problem because there are too many constituents who all have, are pulling in different directions. Um, so as, although I think enforcement is a good idea, um, there's a limit to how much the police are willing to do with that because then they get the store owners screaming. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, John, did you want to respond to uh, something that was raised? Yeah, I actually wanted to uh, agree with Glenn wholeheartedly on that point. Um, one of our, we've thought about enforcement too, and there's, you know, as someone who drives in New York um, all the time, I have to do a lot of errands that need a car. It is endlessly frustrating when you're seeing other people not getting tickets, especially on my block, there's a no standing zone that has 15 cars in it with no tickets. A lot of them have the NYPD vests and things. Um, there is we've thought about enforcement and other other than the fact that um our campaign i think is not really um in a position to be advocating for more interactions from the mypd to people in our community we've found that over and over and over it's not something that has changed with regards to the mypd's enforcement um either technologically or in their sort of initiatives so we thought the best way to approach this is to 
make design choices that are um, able to do the enforcement without creating more police interactions with people, making it not a choice for the store owners to have to decide whether I get a ticket or my customers get a ticket or whether everyone gets a ticket or nobody gets a ticket, which is unbelievably frustrating. Um, there are ways to take this out of the enforcement, uh, the hand of enforcement, and we are advocating more for that because I think we've tried enforcement for like 60, 70 years at this point, and it doesn't seem like it is going to your point. Um, it doesn't make anybody happy. So I just wanted to chime in there and agree with you on that point. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Liz, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say again that like we're not just talking about commercial loading zones for trucks. Like we want per, you know neighborhood loading zones, which could be near commercial streets, so that people visiting businesses or even on them, you know, DOT is it's a pilot for DOT, so they have they don't have a plan for it yet. And we're like I said, we're not experts, but like we'd love it for someone who's making an errand um, instead of you know double parking and blocking traffic or blocking the bus or you know get, making it hard for harder and da more dangerous for everyone on our streets. We'd love it if there was a designated spot that was easy and convenient. That you know you could take your car to if you have to drive um, and go to get what you want to get done and then leave without having to you know interrupt the street or be in an enforcement situation. Um, so I think I think that's part of the goal is to just make streets that work for everyone and that includes making errands um, have have a space that is meant for them instead of just you know long term parking or travel lanes. Thank you, uh, Chair Brown. Uh, your hands up. Uh have a question or comment? I have a comment, um, mostly just about enforcement. And I wholeheartedly agree that enforcement um, could be better. But I also want to point out that we have um, we have businesses that are functioning in Brooklyn and the five boroughs that no longer um, care about enforcement. For example, last mile delivery with Amazon. Uh, they just park wherever they want. And and it is clear when they're parking in front of a hydrant that the company is accepting a $115 uh, fine as part of doing business. Um, and it started with Amazon and now it has moved through UPS and FedEx. So let's, let's you know, identify the fact that n enforcement doesn't always work, um, especially when... Uh, companies have deep pockets. That's my comment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it looks like, uh, sorry if I put your name, R Roisin, uh, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I did want to counter a comment that was made um, kind of just generalizing that business owners were against pedestrian friendly changes and say probably the best thing for business owners would be if people were walking in front of their shop free to walk in and out and if there were spots that were actually for loading so that they could if they needed to get into a taxi get picked up or whatnot i think actually having cars parked for seven days at a time or more if if people aren't even heating alternate side parking is a lot more detrimental than anything that we can do to encourage pedestrian traffic it's um and i would say just i'll add that pedestrian safety and just being able to walk around the neighborhood is my top issue as a um, as a you know voter and resident and whatnot, and we're not newcomers. Um, I know there's been comments in the in the comment area that kind of indicating that this is something that you know folks who are brand new to the area want, and having a place that you can walk around and feel safe, feel like you're not going to get hit, and that you can see as you're crossing the street is the most important thing. And someone just commented about sidewalks. Isn't that what sidewalks are for outside of businesses? And I was responding to someone saying that business owners do not want um, things like double parkers to, for people to get tickets. And when you have double parking, you create really unsafe spots that no one can even pull up to the building or even get into their car or taxis. So there seems to be some kind of like a e either or between you have to pick between just letting cars kind of do whatever they want and I, I too have a car and do use it occasionally um, and creating a safe that's really safe for pedestrians to get around. And I think that the presentation was not misleading at all. I also disagree with that sentiment. Thank you for that. Um, comments are much appreciated. Um, uh, okay, uh, Eric, uh, just saw your hand go up. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, one. Uh, idea that I've been thinking about is uh, if we 
I think about some of these um, multi-lane roads like Coney Island Avenue, where it's, I think, five lanes at certain points. Uh, and I think about what double parking does on that street. While I agree that it it does on some ways increase the danger to pedestrians and other cars, um, at the same time, it, I, I do feel like it's one of the only things on that street that does slow down traffic to a reasonable speed. And so if I were to think through a case where there is perfect enforcement or perfect, uh, you know, uh, following of the laws and there is no, uh, there is no double parking on that street. My sense is it would become like a formula one racetrack. Um, and really just, um, it, it's kind of like, it's an outcome I wouldn't like to see. And I think that would actually increase traffic fatalities, especially for pedestrians, because some of these intersections are such a nightmare that um, I would say that better design is the priority. Second case solution is having double parking everywhere that slows down traffic. And then the worst case scenario is probably no double parking everywhere and very high speeds 24 um, seven. So uh, I think it's uh, a step in the wrong direction to really just focus on removing double parking in a way. I think that the priority should be to make better design. Gotcha. All right. I want to touch on that a little bit um, and more generally about or thinking about enforcement. Uh, there's to, to be, you know, a little bit explicit about uh, what Liz and other folks were saying earlier. We really think that one of the issues here is, you know, guiding people towards the right, you know, towards having good options. And on the parking side, yes, that is if you give people a place where they can stop and unload, they're not going to double park. But to your point about, uh, you know, if we take the double car cars away and it becomes a racetrack, um, there are other things you can do to slow down, you know, to in, to incentivize traffic, you know, to behave better. And that's, uh, you know, I was touching on that a little bit on my slides about, you know, when you have raised intersections and raised crosswalks, you know, there are sort of two benefits. One, it's easier to see people. You have, you know, the drainage issues and so forth, the better. But number two, cars naturally slow down. Uh, when you're talking about uh, you know, pedestrian crossing islands, there are two benefits. One, it's better for pedestrians. Number two, cars cannot sort of veer straight through a left turn and then hit another car uh, and so forth. And so there are things we can do at our streets. And we'd like, and again, as, as people were saying, you know, there's mixed feelings on enforcement. There's also very poor track record of results in terms of enforcement. Uh, I think we the place we're at least thinking we should start is by saying, let's design our streets so that, you know, we're not saying, you know, uh, speed bumps every 10 feet. We're saying let's design our streets so that people go a little bit slower. People have to watch when they're making turns, et cetera, et cetera. And also, so the streets, like there's, there's good options for, you know, people to do the right thing. I don't know if that makes sense, but hopefully, hopefully that's kind of what we're thinking. So, gotcha. Yeah. And, and that's what I mean by design to, to clarify. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, no one has their hands up currently. I did see briefly. Billy put his hand up and Musa put put his hand up. I don't know if either of you guys have anything you want to chime in on. Uh, um, one one uh, thing, uh, I just wanted to add something maybe um, to help refocus some of the conversation, especially around like the businesses aspect. Uh, uh, as we kind of mentioned in the presentation, um, we know that recent surveys have shown, at least in one survey on Church Ave, I just want to re-emphasize this, that 93% of visitors to the stores on Church Ave did not come there using a personal vehicle. Now, obviously, we've already mentioned this, a bunch of our campaign members own cars. John was one of them. We have a few other members, too. And so the idea isn't that we would, you know, relegate car owners to a tiny slice of the street. The idea is that we would redesign the streets or have the city re assess and redesign the streets to make sure we're moving the most amount of people effectively, that the street is actually safer for pedestrians, for people crossing the street, for people who already rely on their bikes to get around, um, and also uh, to move buses quicker. And I think that's a goal that everyone can get behind. Um, there will be some negotiation. There will be some kind of give and take in this whole process of figuring out what the right solution is on any given spot, any given intersection, and any given road. Um, but I think we can all move toward the same goal ultimately to make the neighborhood safer. Great. Thank you. Um, 
the uh, I I just want to thank uh, Florencia to uh, for uh, putting a question in the chat about um, the Coney Island Avenue and Cortelyu intersection because that's a always a hot button. And I I actually considered asking a question about that. Um, so for uh, for those who didn't see it, Florencia asked uh, Sean. If uh, DOT can have a green turning light from Coney Island Avenue to Cortelyu instead of the flashing amber, and Sean's response is that um, we've asked DOT to revisit that single lane more than once, and they've insisted it's signaled as intended and for optimal safety and traffic flow. So there you have it. Um, and uh, okay, yeah. So um, you know that that but that is an issue for as long as I've lived in this area. Uh, the issue of that 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 intersection has come up, and I know there was Facebook this Facebook post discussion about it over the last few days. So um, that's that's definitely uh, one that that community members should keep our eyes on, and and uh, hopefully hopefully DOT will revisit it at some point because it doesn't seem Can like I, it's working. Yeah, I jump in? I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just just I don't want to lose that thread because uh, with, with a new council member representing the district, the time might be right to ask to make that request again through the council members district. We we get sort of time limited. You can't ask the same question more than once in a certain time period, but but uh, council member Rita Joseph sure could. Yeah, great suggestion. All right, thanks. So that's, you know, something all of us can keep in mind is, and the, some of the presenters maybe <coughs> can take that back. Um, all right, uh, so uh, this was some, some very uh, engaging discussion. Thanks everyone. Thanks for, you know, very, very active reactive chat and uh, you know really appreciated all the comments that folks had thank you so much for the presenters for for coming by uh, Kathy Liz uh, Musa John uh, Jeffrey really appreciate it uh, Liz did you have something you wanted to add I just wanted to reiterate again that we're very interested in hearing other people's experiences and if you want to come to our campaign meetings either way you know you can reach us it's on our website um, I put it in the chat but you can reach us at Flatbush Streets for people at gmail.com um, we really do want to make a district that works for everyone um, so just you know wanted to invite your feedback again we're definitely taking everything we've heard here but um, if there's further communication people are interested in we would love to hear it thanks so much Liz um, and uh... Before we close, I just wanted to mention, we actually have a, another transportation committee meeting coming up next month, uh, May 4th. Uh, so folks can put in their calendars and uh, Sean put in the chat, I'm not sure if everyone saw, but one of the topics uh, DOT will be presenting and uh, it'll be a review. Uh, one of the topics is gonna be a review of the Church Avenue bus lane. So that'll be interesting to hear because uh, they came to us before started and made a presentation about uh, how it was needed. And uh, it'll be good to, uh, after a few years, uh, revisit how things have been going uh, from the DOT's perspective. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Barden, I don't know if you had anything else, but uh, I think with that, uh, there's nothing else we can, we can close no, this. I just uh, appreciate the free and frank discussion that we just had, and it's always welcome in the committee. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Oh, and thanks, Sean and Anya, for all you do behind the scenes. We really appreciate it. All right, have a good night, everyone. Oh, it's right, everyone.